We're now in the, uh, in the fourth and final hortatory interjection. If you know how I'm looking at this, borrowing an outline from George Guthrie's commentary, how he sees the book of Hebrews as an exposition on Christ, and then you have these interjections of exhortation. And I've pointed them out as we've traveled through the book. And now we're in the last and final one that goes from chapter 10, verse 26, down to chapter 13, verse 19. And beginning in chapter 11, the writer, he presents the positive example of faithful people in history. And we've looked at that. I'm just kind of reviewing to get us back into the flow of, of the writer's thought. He goes back and he has them look at faithful people in history, and this is a powerful thing to do. It, you know, to look at examples of people, I don't know about you, but I'm very challenged when I see the faith of you know, the people on whose shoulders we stand. When I see people you know, who are being sawn in two, you know, I'm just sitting here going, you, know, you want to feel like a really small, uh, spiritually small person. You look at these, these giants of faith, and he's pointing them to that, saying, listen, you know, look, at, look at the faith that has been exhibited in the past. And he does that in chapter 11. In verses 4 through 12, he speaks of the faith of, of Abel and Enoch, Noah and Abraham. Then in verses 17 and 22 of, of chapter 11, he speaks of the faith of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Verses 23 through 31, he speaks of the faith of Moses' parents, Moses, the Israelites, when they marched around Jericho, and the faith of Rahab. All of these examples, he's saying, these are people who are willing to live and to act on the basis of the unseen promises. They trusted God, even though they're living between the promise and the fulfillment, they had such confidence in God. They knew that he would do what he said he would do, that they would order their lives accordingly. And I've made the point, and I'll make it again, you know, that's biblical faith. You see, biblical faith must translate into life or it's not biblical faith. Biblical faith is never this notion of intellectual assent. It is an ordering of one's life in conformity with one's confession. It is a genuine belief of surrender. So there's an extent to which this whole thing about, you know, faith and work stuff is, uh, is kind of a mirage, you know, that these two things go together. They're not separate. It's not like, well, faith is simply this intellectual assent and then works is, no, biblical faith translates into life. And we understand that in other contexts, and I've pointed that out. Verses 32 through 38, he gives a sample. He says, I don't have time to go through. Of course, he doesn't have time to go through and redo the whole Old Testament, but he gives a sample of six individuals from the time of judges through the united monarchy. And then he adds this general category and the prophets. And through faith, you see that these, these men, they experienced tremendous triumphs in God's cause. And he summarizes those triumphs in verses 33 through the first part of 35. But through that same faith, other people, they experienced and endured great hardship and suffering. And he summarizes their experience in the second part of verse 35 through verse 38. So this idea, you know, that faith is always onward, upward, victory, you know, conquest. It is that sometimes, but there also, there's suffering. You see, there is this idea of, of enduring, heroic endurance of suffering is not inconsistent at all with God's working. You see it here in these people. And you and I understand that in our lives, okay? That we're not, we're not placed in a bubble, as I said last week, and I've said many times before. You know, when you become a Christian, it's not like you get the guard all shield from the old Gleam commercial. Uh, you know, you get this protective shield that makes you bulletproof from all adversity in the world. Just look around. We have a dear sister who's going in for brain surgery tomorrow, right? Gary Johnson, well, why is that? What do you want to say? Well, it's because if they had adequate faith, you see, they wouldn't. Look, I, I hope I've made clear to you, I think that's crazy. Okay, that's wrong. That you and I live in this world and we experience suffering here and we are called as Christians to endure this faithfully. Okay, faithfully. So he, he shows that you have both sides of this. In the world, 
judge these great heroes of faith as unworthy. But as the writer indicates in verse 38, the reality is that the world was not worthy of them. These great heroes of faith, these people, they're out here, you know, hiding in caves and holes. And how's the world treat them? The world is hostile. And yet the writer under inspiration of God says the truth of the matter is the world wasn't worthy of them. You see, they, they are leaven in this world. They are God's representatives and the world wasn't worthy of them. Okay, let's pick back up in verses 39 and 40. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive the promise God having provided something better for us so that they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. Despite the fact, see, their faith spoke highly of them. It commended them as examples. That's why he's just cited them. They have tremendous faith. Their faith commended them as examples. But despite that fact, none of the heroes of Jewish history he's just spoken about received the ultimate goal. None of them received the ultimate goal of permanent dwelling in a permanent homeland. That ultimate goal is realized only through Christ's work. So they were great heroes of faith, but they didn't receive the ultimate goal. See, because of Christ, all the faithful throughout history will share together in resurrection life and eternal glory. It is only together as one community... People in the past, people in the present, that we will all as one together enter into that consummated state of resurrection life and eternal glory. We're all coming together. Let me read to you what Donald Hagner says about it. He's a, a well-known New Testament guy. He's got a commentary on, uh, on Hebrews. I've quoted him a number of times before. He says, herein lies a paradox. God's faithful people of the past, remote and recent, have lived their lives in accordance with the promise of a great unseen future reality. Although some experienced a degree of fulfillment in history, none have arrived at the ultimate goal, the promise. That final eschatological end-time fulfillment has been delayed until the present. The reason for this is now given. God's people of every age constitute a unity and must arrive at the perfection of the telos, the end, the goal. They must arrive at the perfection of the telos together. Of course, a basic aspect of the delay is the newness of what God has accomplished through the work of Christ. Since for our author, all that preceded Christ is related to him as promise is related to fulfillment, no attainment of the telos has been conceivable until the present. God has planned literally foresaw or provided something better for us. That something better is the new covenant with all of its blessings, which is for us in distinction from those of the past, only because we are privileged who have received it. We are the privileged who have received it through the historical process. In other words, we are here on this side of the cross. Okay, in history, Christ came though his crucifixion blessed all people because it underwrites all forgiveness ever. But we are the historical beneficiary of it because we live post-cross. Okay, then he says, but in a more fundamental sense, it belongs to all the faithful of every age. As we've talked about as we've gone through, there is no divine forgiveness apart from the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. His blood underwrites all forgiveness. Okay, before after okay he says but in a more fundamental sense it belongs to all the faithful from every age we have begun to taste of its fruit already in the present these last days of the already present age to come see this is what i've tried to to relay countless times the idea of this overlapping of ages and that the the future has invaded the present that the kingdom has been consummated but we await I mean, it's been inaugurated, but we await its consummation. We live in this overlap of age. He says, but we together with those faithful people of the past will yet experience the consummation of God's purposes, which may now all, pursue, which may now all being prepared occur at any time. So we are on that day. It is going to be the most glorious thing that you can imagine as we all the redeemed of God will enter in together into that eternal 
state, and resurrection life, and eternal glory. So all of us together, we are one in that the blood of Christ has provided all forgiveness and we all enter in together. You see, and I think that's, uh, that's some powerful stuff. He says in chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, see, 12, we're getting to the end, right? Just one more chapter. Okay, I hear you guys cheering. Okay, he says, therefore, since we have such a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, remember the people he's talked about, and hear this for yourselves, right? I mean, we try to understand the Bible first by understanding what was the Spirit of God saying through the writer of Hebrews to the original audience. But we do that so we can hear clearly what God is saying to us today through it, right? The word is living, active. It is here. He speaks to us through this word. And so what is he saying to us? He says, therefore, since we have such a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also, having laid aside every weight and the easily entangling sin, run with endurance the race set before us, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of the faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. You remember that the, the circumstance into which he's writing, that uh, you have here, he's writing some peop- to some people who are in, they're being tempted to turn away from Christianity and to go back to Uh, some form of Judaism. And so they have a lot of pressures on them. They have social pressures from their family. They looks like they have political pressures looming on the horizon of a state that is not fond of Christians. And you can see how that makes it, you know, you say, you look for every reason, then how can I turn, how can I justify letting go of Christ? And so he writes this letter to them saying, you can't. You can't. You hold to Jesus, hold to Jesus. He then gives them... In encouraging them to do that, he gives them this example of these tremendous people of faith who have endured all kinds of things. Why? Because God has said this thing and I trust him. Okay? God says, I'm going to flood the world. I'm building an ark. Where is it? I don't see it, but he told me and I'm building it. Okay, we live our lives that way. Then he says, therefore, since we have such a great cloud of witnesses, let us also... Let us also join that company. What is God saying to him? He's saying, listen to me. You've seen these people. You see how they endured great things in the name of God, in the name of Christ for faith. Well, you be like that. You endure things. Here are people sitting here saying, you know, this is hard. You know, I might face this. I might face that. My family is shunning me. Hey, hey. You know, if that be it, I hope it's not, but if that be it, Christ, right? Christ, whatever it cost, whatever it cost, family, boyfriend, girlfriend, job, Christ, okay? Now, that's, that's the truth. You know, Jesus calls, he says, listen, I'm, I'm it. I call you and I have to be the top thing in your life, right? If you come and choose me, You pick me, you come and die, or you don't have me at all. I don't play second fiddle. It is because of who I am and what I've done. But he says, since we have such a cloud of witnesses, let us also, having laid aside every weight and the easily entangling sin, run with endurance the race before us. Run with endurance. We thought, what are we going to do with the young people? Don't we always say, what are we going to do with the young people? Well, he says, you know, Let us run with endurance. Do you mean you're telling me that young people are being pulled? They're being told by our culture, you don't want to go and hang out in church where all those old people hang out. You don't want to do that. You want to be cool. Oh, so they're being pulled, are they? They're being taught. You raised them up and taught them about Jesus Christ and this world is telling them, no, 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 there's nothing found there. You want real life? Real life is in the cool scene. You know, you go out and hang out, do out whatever, whatever's done there. You can tell I don't hang out there. They won't let me in looking the way I do. <laughs> but, you know, this is so, this wasn't, so people just, you know, no, that, this, it's just kind of, and then, then we start with the justification. Well, I don't believe it and all this stuff. And they get pulled and they're getting pulled. And what does he say? He sits here and says, look, lay aside every weight and easy. Run with endurance the race before us. 
We call people to run with endurance. You're not the first person to ever have difficulties and be pulled. People live in the world. We're all living here. But we are called to run with endurance. That means stick to That means carrying it. That means bearing it. Instead of saying, well, hey, I didn't know there was going to be any cost associated with this. Do you mean that my friends are going to think I'm kind of a bonehead if I believe homosexual conduct is sinful? Oh, how can I hold my head up? How can I tell them that? They'll be going, you must be a bigot. Right? Do you feel that pressure? I know some of you do now. I know you do. Okay, well, okay. Everybody's pressed and pulled. Okay, but we are called to run with endurance, and he tells us something here about it, how to go about it. He says, look, you have this great cloud of predecessors who through their faith they bear witness to the church that God's promises can be trusted. Isn't that what they're telling us? Through the lives they lived, through what they endured for the sake of the unseen promise. What they don't see, they just say, I know this is true, I'm going to live in accordance with it. They are bearing witness to the church that God can be trusted. And so we have given this this cloud of witnesses, these predecessors. He urges them to run with endurance the race set before them. And doing so, he says, look, this involves laying aside every weight. Okay, everything that might wear us down in the marathon of the Christian life. Every weight, right? You and I are running a marathon. We're in the Christian life. And there are things that will weigh us down. Everything that weighs us down, we are to lay it aside. Things like fear and doubt. We are to put those aside. Now, how do you do that? Sometimes, see, you have to to deal with these things. You have to address them. As I've said before, I think it's John Stott who says that, you know, we... We cannot pander to a man's intellectual arrogance, but we must cater to his intellectual integrity. You see, and I've said before, I think that too many times questions that people have about Christianity, the faith, the Bible, and these kinds of things, they suppress them rather than dealing with them, and then they go down and they wind up eroding their faith. Okay, God is the truth. The truth needs no, you know, nothing to be feared about inquiring. This book has been around a long time, will withstand any examination, anything. Okay, so we have to be, we have to be sure, lay aside these things like fear and doubt, because they will grind you down. If you don't lay aside all these weights, you get tired of the run. And he says, laying aside, well, how are you going to run this race with endurance? Laying aside everything, every weight, and also laying aside sin that easily entangles and thus makes running a tremendous chore. Do you see the picture that he has of sin? You and I are in this race. We're running this marathon, and we got all this stuff strapped to us, tying us up and binding us. Well, you can see what a bus that is trying to run like that, and what happens? I couldn't run a marathon on my best day. But I can, I can imagine, you see, just like, just all the extra. You see, so this laying aside the sin that so easily entangles, you know how people are. If they want to sit here and live in the world and get wrapped up in sin, You know, it's drudgery for them to honor Christ, to live for Christ. Why? Because they're trying to say, listen, I want to rationalize doing this and doing that. And he says, you have to lay these things. If you want to run with endurance, you have to lay these things aside. So when we're talking to young people, say, what are you going to do? We got to tell them that. We have to tell them that. No, you can't hang out and live in sexual immorality. Is that offensive to people to say that? I mean, I don't know. I mean, I just think it's the truth. We seem apologetic about it sometimes. It's just the truth. You have to, if you're going to run with endurance, you hop in bed with somebody and stay there, and I'm guaranteeing you you're not going to run with endurance. Because I know what will happen. Next thing you know, out is Christianity stupid. Now, you may keep showing up, but you've now been grabbed by something else. And you may have a story, but, but you see, if you're wrapped up in that, so we have to tell people that. We have to tell them. You know, so you, this running this race with endurance, laying aside every weight, laying aside the sin that entangles us, and then we run with endurance. And running with endurance, the race set before us also involves fixing our eyes on Jesus, the ultimate example. You want to run the race? 
You want young people, old people, I don't care who it is, to run the race with endurance, to bear the things in the Christian life that come in there? Or did you think you just come here and say, listen, I'm going to buy some life insurance from you, Lord. I think that if I hang with you, then it'll just be, this will be life. I'll just be kind of floating through. There won't be any difficulty. And as soon as difficulty comes, I say, hey, that's not what I bargained for. I'm out. Well, that sounds like a parable to me about somebody. You see, when difficulties come, we're out. Okay? But this idea that we have to run with endurance and we focus on Jesus Christ in doing it, he's described as the author and perfecter of the faith. He's the author or originator of the faith and that he's the object of the Christian faith and thus the one who brought it into being. Right? I mean, he's the focus of our faith. He's the one in whom we trust. So he's the author, the originator of the faith. And he's also the author of the faith of preceding generations. And he's the one who made that faith effective for salvation. The blessings associated with the faith of any era were underwritten by the blood of Jesus. Okay? He is the basis of all the forgiveness. And so here, people before the cross who in faith received blessings, it is because of him. Okay, and it's in that same sense. That's the sense in which he's the perfecter of the faith. He's the one who brought faith to its goal. The one who secured the eternal blessings that are appropriated by faith. You know, there's nothing inherent in faith. See, it is faith. It is because of Christ's crucifixion that there's something for faith to appropriate. He atoned for sins. He reconciled humanity. And we receive that in, by faith. And so he's underwritten all of it. So he is the author and the perfecter of the faith. He brings it to completion. Okay, so that, I mean, there's, there's nobody like him. He's also the ultimate example of endurance. Right, when we're talking about, well, well, how do you expect people to endure the pressures here? You know, how do you expect them when, when a guy tells his girlfriend, he says, listen, if you won't be sexually immoral, I'm going to have to look elsewhere. I'm going to you know, I'm gonna have to find somebody else. Oh, how can we expect somebody to carry that burden and be faithful to Jesus? Well, what did he carry? What did he carry? Look, I mean, what, what's he say here? He says, he said, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of the faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning the shame. I have said before, the cross... You know, when we kill people today, when we ex use, you know, employ the death penalty, we, we do it on the basis of if, if we're a state that says, okay, we're going to give lethal injection. When you get the death penalty, everybody gets lethal injection. If you're doing it some other way, everybody who gets the death penalty dies that way. Okay? In the ancient world, it wasn't like that. They had different kinds of ways of killing you. And one of the ways they kill, you know, it, it depended on who you were, your crime, your social status, and crucifixion was for the lowest of the low. It was a shameful death where they strip you naked, beat you, you know all this. And they crucify you in a public place. But you, you bore all of the shame that was associated with being a rebel against the state. And for Jews, you even had the, had the extra burden because they thought that someone crucified was cursed of God. Because of the text, it says, cursed is everyone hung on a tree. Okay, so here you have this shame now, I want you to understand, you would endure a lot of stuff to avoid shame. I know, look, look, you know, a lot of us would rather take a beating than be shamed. You hate being shamed, okay? And here is the Son of God who endures the cross and he says, scorning the shame. Not only did he endure all that's involved in that, the physical suffering, but beyond that, the bearing of the sins of the world, becoming accursed of God. Like you see in Galatians 3.13. He says, becoming accursed of God. Okay, that's what he bore. And all the shame that's attached to it. And then we turn to somebody and say, well, how can you expect them to bear that? He says, look to Jesus. He is an example. You see what he bore? And then don't ask me that question. You are called as his disciples to bear whatever he calls you to bear. He went to the cross. He's the example. Where do I look? I look to him. 
He said, it is seated at the right hand, uh, seated at the right hand of the throne of God. See, he's the ultimate example. He looked beyond the horror of the cross, scorning its shame, to the exaltation that was on the other side, the exaltation of the right hand of God. And that's what we have to get people to see. Somebody who's facing a difficult decision in this life, they say, listen, I'm focused on the here and now. My boyfriend's going to dump me if I don't play along. Okay? Well, that's a very real thing, a real and present deal. We have to get them to see that there's also a real deal that's out beyond that. And it's not just, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, make believe. It's the truth. You see, and if, if we can't instill that into people, you know, I harp on this all the time. That's what the issue is. Okay, it is generating in people a genuine conviction that this is the truth. This isn't something that, you know, nice folks make up to get together to try to ease their feeling about dying. It is the truth of God. And we need to live that way. So this person needs to say, listen, I understand this is a real and present thing, but there's also something out beyond that, and I will not dishonor the one who died for me for you. Now, praise God if somebody would say that. I would like to hear somebody saying that. To the guy who's doing that to the girl or any other example you want to come up with. How this world pressures us. Somebody says, listen, you know, I see what you're doing, but don't let the door hit you because I serve a risen Savior. You see? Now, we ought to expect that from people. We ought to expect that from people. You know, who are you bothering? You're going to see. We have an obligation to one another, okay? And I think we underplay it too much. We have an obligation and a responsibility to one another, and we need to work that. See, we need to be, you know, what is flowing through the body of Christ, that it is effective, that it works, and we have this responsibility to one another, and we have to pay great attention to it. Okay, he says in 12.3, he says, by all means... Consider the one who endured such hostility against himself by sinners so that you not grow weary giving out in your souls. Okay? He emphasizes here. He emphasizes, restates the need to focus on Jesus who endured the ultimate abuse from sinners. And he specifies the reason for doing so. Why should we focus on Jesus who endured the ultimate abuse from sinners? He says, so that they not grow weary in the, from the struggle and give up the faith. It's a struggle in this world. Right? Well, you need to focus on Him. You know, you think, you, well, I, I don't think I'll come to church for months on end. I don't think I'll read the Bible. I don't think I'll pray. I think I'll completely disconnect from God. And you think you're going to fight in this spiritual battle? You know, I, I don't know, you know where you're getting this delusion from, but you're not. You're not. You have to be plugged in. You have to be active. You have to be drawing on the word of God. You have to be pursuing this. You know, this isn't vacation land. Where you sit there and say, I just think I just will put no effort into Christian living. I won't do it. And then I think that I will stand when I'm assaulted. And you won't. Fix your eyes on Jesus. And he says, listen, do that so that you not grow weary from the struggle and give up in the faith. See, as he was blessed by his patient endurance, what happened through his patient endurance? He bore all of this. What was the outcome? He's glorified. An honor to God, seated at the right hand. Well, you hang on. You bear the difficulty that you're in. You bear the struggle, and you'll be blessed. You have to believe that, though. Do you see? Do you see the issue's faith? At bottom, now I understand people go out and they come up with all kinds of junk. They come up with all kinds of rationalizations, but I'm talking about the real issue. The real issue is a conviction and a trust in the unseen. Okay? It is believing that and trusting that. Then he says in 4 through 8, I'm going to read 4 through 11 and come back and just read 4 through 8. Do it in two different slides here. He says, in struggling against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of blood. Now, remember, he's talking to people, right, who are 
ready to leave away. Now listen to what he says to them. And I just think that if we said these kinds of things to people, I'm saying it right now. But wouldn't, we, wouldn't people say, well, you know, I, I just think it, it's too edgy. It's just, you know, I just don't think you can talk to people this way. But he says to them, in struggling against sin, you've not yet resisted to the point of blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation which he addresses to you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor lose heart when rebuked by him. For the Lord disciplines whom he loves, and he chastises every son whom he accepts. Endure trials for the sake of discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom a father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become sharers, then you're illegitimate and not sons. Moreover, we had the fathers of our flesh, we had the fathers of our flesh as correctors, and we respected them. Should we not much more subject ourselves to the father of the spirits so that we will live? For they indeed disciplined us for a few days according to what seemed good to them. But he disciplines us for our benefit in order for us to share in his holiness. But all discipline for the moment does not seem to be pleasant but painful. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who've been trained by it. Okay, back to the beginning of this if I can handle that. Okay, he says in verses 4 through 8, unlike what Jesus endured. Okay, he's telling them look to Jesus as an example, but he says, unlike what he endured, they had not yet shed their blood in their struggle against sin, in their struggle against denying him in the face of hostility. Okay, well, this is pretty radical, isn't it? He says, listen, you haven't died yet in your struggle against sin. You haven't given up your life yet. You want to look to Jesus? You're still a long way from him. You haven't died yet in your struggle against sin, in your struggle against, you know, against denying him in the face of hostility. You mean I have to fight that hard, resist that much? That's what he's calling us to. He's calling us to that kind of commitment. And I just say, okay, well, that scares people. That scares people. So what we want to do then, we'll kind of transform things and we'll kind of be like a, a fuzzy self-help group. I want to be the church. You see? I want to be the church and I want to tell the truth about God. I want to call people to this. That says, listen, this is a radical deal we're in on. Okay, this is a radical deal. He tells them, you haven't yet resisted to the point of blood. You haven't done that. Okay, in your struggle against denying him. Well, I'm being pressured to do this. Okay, we'll stand up to it. Hold on to Jesus and confess him above everything else. Given what Jesus endured, they can endure the lesser pressure they're facing, right? I mean, that's his point. He says, Jesus, he's your example. He went to the cross and died. He says, you're not near that yet. You're not near that yet. So certainly you can withstand the lesser pressures and burdens that have come on you. Look at what he endured. And that's how we're to be. As we face all of these different things that come our way. He asked if they've forgotten the exhortation. God addressed to his children in Proverbs chapter 3 verses 11 and 12. He's quoting from the Septuagint. See the essence of these verses is that, is that God's discipline. It shouldn't be considered insignificant. Or, or be a source of discouragement. Hardship. Difficulty. Discipline. You shouldn't make light of it and consider it insignificant, nor should it be a source of discouragement because it's an expression of God's love and an indication that the objects of that discipline are sons and daughters. Do you see the completely different outlook the Spirit of God puts on their suffering? They're looking at it saying, this is reason to leave. I'm getting pressured. And he's saying it's not reason to leave. It's an indication of how much God loves you. It's an indication, see, that you're being treated as sons and daughters. And I think that's just a very important perspective for living in this world. It's a very important perspective. The author says, in essence, in verse 7, the second part in verse 8, that the mistreatment they're facing because of their allegiance to Christ, okay, the mistreatment they're facing because of their allegiance to Christ is not an indication of God's absence, 
or an indication of his inattention. On the contrary, it's a sign that they truly are children of God. Do you see how that would revolutionize your bearing difficulties? If instead of seeing them as somehow a failure of God, somehow he's not living up to his bargain, if you saw that as his blessing in your life, his discipline for you to carry, to strengthen you, he's disciplining you in love and attention. I know it's easy to say, as I sit here, healthy, except for a minor cold. I know it's easy to say. But other people bear these things, and this is the perspective, you see. How do you do it? It gives meaning to suffering. And that's what the Spirit of God is saying to these brothers and sisters who are enduring this kind of stuff. He's saying, don't make light of that, and don't see it as somehow a sign that God has gone away. He has not gone away. These things are a sign of his caring. They're an indication that you truly are sons and daughters of God. Then he says in verse 9, I, I read through the whole thing, but in verses 9, 9 through 11, he says in verse 9 that, that given how they respected their human fathers in response to their discipline, okay, this is just assumed. Maybe you couldn't assume that in our culture. But this was understood, that they respected their fathers who had disciplined them while they were growing up. See, and given how they did that, how they respected their human fathers in response to their discipline, they should much more submit to their heavenly father in response to his discipline. Okay, I'm getting I'm difficulties, hardships, families ignoring me, treating me like dirt. Uh, the society looks like it's going to come down on me with the hammer. And he sits here and he says, listen, just as you respected your earthly fathers when they disciplined you, you should much more submit to your heavenly father in response to this discipline that you're currently experiencing you should much more do that. In other words, rather than wavering in loyalty to him, rather than allowing the circumstances to cause you to go, I don't know if it's a wise move to trust in God. Rather than wavering in loyalty to him, you see, they should be all the more surrendered to him. The discipline and the hardship indicates God's discipline and his caring concern. And as you respected your earthly father for it, you should all the more submit to your heavenly father for his. Rather than wavering, okay? Because of the fear of persecution or because of the persecution, you should be all the more surrendered to him. For our human fathers, they disciplined us from a fallible human perspective and for more limited and mundane objectives according to what seemed good to them. Okay? They're human beings, fallible. They had this more limited perspective, and they are disciplining us for these more limited and mundane objectives. They're doing it for what seemed good to them, but God disciplines us with perfect insight into our benefit and in order that we may share in his holiness. So he says, if you respected your earthly fathers for their discipline, how much more should you submit? Recommit your life to God in hardship. Right? This is what he's telling us. Now, I'm not saying it's an easy lesson. Okay? And it's certainly from the vantage point of one who's doing fine. I understand how it sounds, but I think I'm telling you the truth. If I didn't think it, I wouldn't say it to you. Okay? I can be wrong. But not intentionally so. Okay? I think that's what he's saying to us. Is that we, when we have these difficulties in God, we need to see them as God's discipline and blessing. And because of that reason, hold him all the tighter. Okay, so if I can go back to the example I used about the dude who's, who's leaning on his girlfriend. Okay? This is a hardship, real kind of stuff, hardship in life. And somebody ought to, ought to see this difficulty here. What do you see there? Why is this happening to me? And maybe that's a petty kind of example. But why is this happening to me? You need to hold all the more to God, all the stronger, and see that there are things at work in this world trying to pull you away from him. Okay, so the writer acknowledges that all discipline is painful when it's being administered. We're almost through here. All discipline is painful when it's being administered, but what it produces is worth the pain. I mean, that's how it is. That's the motive. That's what discipline is about. It, what it produces is worth the pain. The Lord's discipline yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. You know, we ought to value that. 
We ought to value righteous living and not just simply say, well, you know what, I'm saved by grace, six, one, half, doesn't, I don't care how I live. No. We have to value righteousness, and sometimes righteousness comes through bearing difficulty so that you learn to walk in the holiness of God. And if it has that effect, then you ought to go out and praise him because I'm now living more righteously because of the hardship with which you disciplined me. Thank you, Father. And I understand. Easy to say from here. Okay? But I think it's the truth. Thank you for coming.